Good evening and welcome to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's Exploring Space Lecture Series for 2021. I'm Ross Irwin, geologist and chair of the Museum Center for Earth and Planetary Studies, where we do original research on the planets and moons of the solar system. This year's Exploring Space Lectures highlight the robotic missions that visit and sample other worlds, the planets Mars and Venus, Saturn's largest moon Titan, and the asteroid Bennu. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Tim McCoy, Chair of the Department of Mineral Sciences at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. His department is responsible for a world-class collection of rocks, minerals, meteorites, and gems, the highlights of which are on display at the Natural History Museum. Dr. McCoy's expertise as a curator of meteorites, including from the interiors of asteroids and the volcanic surface of Mars, made him a natural fit for the OSIRIS-REx mission to sample the asteroid Bennu. He is coordinating the geologic mapping of the asteroid from orbit. When the samples are returned to Earth, he will compare them with known meteorites and study how water and impacts have altered them over time. Previously, he served on planetary missions to Mercury, the asteroid Eros, Mars, and the small world Ceres and Vesta in the asteroid belt. He also is a co-investigator on Psyche, which is scheduled to launch next year to study a unique metal asteroid orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. Dr. McCoy has a Bachelor of Science degree from Eastern Illinois University, a Master's from the University of New Mexico, and a PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He has received numerous awards for science, service, outreach, and spacecraft mission achievement. Asteroid 4259 McCoy was named after him in recognition of his research on the complex heating and melting events on the parent body of the Acapulcoite and Lodronite meteorites. After Dr. McCoy speaks, we'll have time for questions and answers, so please feel free to submit your questions in the chat. Afterward, you can visit the National Air and Space Museum's website for more information on the upcoming Exploring Space lectures. I'm grateful to our sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance, for their continued support of this series. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight to see how we can go about sampling an asteroid to understand the birth of our planet. Thank you for that generous introduction, Ross, and I'd like to thank the sponsors for making this lecture series possible. I'm gonna to talk to you tonight, tonight about the OSIRIS-REx mission. If I could have the first slide. For most people, robotic spacecraft missions are a little like a crime movie. You tune in at the beginning, you know, you turn on the news, this would have been the news you would have seen October 20th of last year, and you see this amazing technological accomplishment uh, touching the surface of an asteroid in order to sample and understand the birth of our planet. But then you wonder, well, how did we get here? And where are we going after that? Well, that's what I wanna fill in for you tonight, that how, why, where, and where we're going. It might surprise you that this mission, intellectually, the driver for this, and most of the missions you're gonna hear about in this series, actually really began Christmas Eve of 1968. At that moment, the astronauts of Apollo 8 were orbiting the moon. They came from behind the moon and captured this iconic image, Earthrise, the Earth rising above the surface of the moon. And at that moment, they realized the uniqueness of our planet in the vast darkness of space, with its water-rich oceans teeming with life and the continents, the silica-rich continents that literally rise above that ocean. And that's caused people to wonder, scientists, for, for 50 years now, about three very simple questions. What is the source of water for the oceans? Where did it come from? How did continents first form? How did we get these silica-rich continents? And how did life originate? Well, the answers to these questions, you can find clues on the modern Earth, but really the answers lie in the deep past of our planet, a period called the Hadean named for the god of the underworld. The Hadean, the earth was literally a hellscape with incoming fireballs, with volcanic eruptions. And that bright object that you see in the background of this image isn't the sun, that's the moon, much closer to earth and with the still molten outer shell from its formation. And so when we ask questions like, where did water come from? It either had to be outgassed from those volcanoes early in the history of our planet or delivered by those incoming meteorites. The same thing for the organics. And so to find these clues, we really have to go to the remotest corners of our planet 
and our solar system. And so these are some images from my colleagues. The top image is uh, my colleague Liz Cottrell in the Aleutians in a very unusual type of island, which is a silicic island erupting in the middle of an ocean, basically the birthplace of continents. And she went there to learn about how continents first form. In the outback of Australia, in the Jack Hills, you can find 4.4 billion year old zircons, tiny little grains, only a hundredth the width of a human hair. And those grains are the oldest minerals on earth, recording the birth of continents on the early earth. But sometimes we have to go into space. And so the lower image on the left is the asteroid Bennu, which I'm gonna to talk to you a fair bit about tonight. And you see there a rocky body. That's what most people would say when they see that image. But what I see is this. I see the birth of our solar system, this swirling cloud of gas and dust around the proto-sun, around the early forming sun, with rocks starting to accrete, smaller rocks building into bigger and bigger rocks. Now, many of those accreted to form the planets, the rocky and gaseous planets of our solar system, the cores of those gaseous planets. But in one part of the solar system, in the part between Mars and Jupiter, the perturbations of Jupiter kept a planet from forming. And there we can find these primitive asteroids that record the first 100 million years of our solar system, a history that's basically been wiped out on our own planet. And so we have to travel into space. Now, when we go there, we have to decide, well, where do we wanna go? This is just a map of the asteroid belt. This happens to be where all the asteroids were on January 1st, 2018. And the Vs are comets in here. Now, most of the asteroids, the yellow dots, form in the asteroid belt, this region between Mars and Jupiter. You can see clusters 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind Jupiter. Those are called the Trojan asteroids. The Lucy mission is about to launch to go visit the Trojan asteroids. But what we're going to focus on tonight are the asteroids inside the main belt, Earth-crossing asteroids because those are a special population. Those are ones that we can actually get to with spacecraft we have, pick up a sample and bring it back to Earth. And so that's what we had to choose. Now we've been to asteroids before, including near Earth asteroids. This is a, a really cool image of the asteroid Itakawa, which was visited by the Hayabusa spacecraft. And if you look carefully, if you can see my pointer, this little thing right here on the edge of the asteroid is actually the shadow of the Hayabusa spacecraft on the asteroid Itakawa. And the other thing you'll notice is that there's this smooth region, this belt that cuts across Itakawa. And that belt is fine-grained material. That's gonna be important in a second, and I'll, I'll tell you why. But we've seen these ponds, we call them, because they're flat, smooth areas, on nearly every asteroid we had visited to this point. And so the assumption was ponds would occur on whatever asteroid we visited in the future. So how do we go about choosing Bennu? You know, how do we get from hundreds of thousands or millions of asteroids down to just one? Well, at the time we were making the selection, there were about 500,000 known asteroids with, with orbits that you could actually predict where they were gonna be when you got there. Of those, about 7,000 were near-Earth asteroids. There were 192 with orbits that allowed us to get there, collect a sample, and bring it back. Only 26 of those had a diameter greater than 200 meters. We didn't want to go to a five-meter object, and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later as to why that's the case. But importantly, the asteroids that we had visited before this, like Itakawa, were carbon poor. They were a certain kind of asteroid that probably formed in the inner solar system, and they didn't contain those prebiotic organics, the building blocks of life. So we wanted to target a carbon-rich asteroid, and we can tell remotely by looking at the light reflected off an asteroid whether an asteroid is in fact carbon-rich. That got it down to five asteroids, and from that we chose an asteroid which ultimately gained the name Bennu. Bennu is often envisioned as an Egyptian um, figure as a bird, um, uh, self-created and pivotal to the origin of life. 
And so a very appropriate name for this asteroid, and you'll see a connection to it in just a minute. Now we knew a little bit about Bennu. We had done some imaging of Bennu. We had looked at it through a telescope. We had actually done some radar imaging. So we had used um, large radars um, to look at the shape of the asteroid, to model the shape of the asteroid. And what we saw was this sort of double top model with a ridge. You can see it here on the left. And Bennu is about 510 meters across. That's a little bit larger than the Empire State Building or the Eiffel Tower, but only half a kilometer. So really not a huge object relative to some we've been to. You know, asteroids like Eros were 33 kilometers long, so more than 60 times the size, the length of Bennu. So we knew we were going to this sort of semi-spherical, top-shaped um, object about a half a kilometer in size. So the first thing we had to do, and, and you probably think, well, you know, this all goes pretty quickly. We might be surprised it's 2021, and I started working on this mission in 2003. We went through three rounds of proposals, two in the discovery class, and then there was the introduction of the New Frontiers class of missions, and we ultimately won in the New Frontiers class and got permission to launch. And so you have to design a spacecraft and here you can see our spacecraft, um, the solar panel sticking out to the side, the large silver conical shaped object is the high gain antenna, that's for talking to Earth. On the bottom deck, you can see this white round object, that's the sample return canister, that's what would bring the sample back to the Earth. There's a bunch of instruments mounted there and we'll talk about those in just a minute. And there's this long arm, the tag sam, we call it the touch and go sample, uh, acquisition mechanism. Now, you might think, well, we started working on this in 2003, um, you know, it's 2021, so we must have spent quite a bit of time on the surface of this asteroid. In practice, the device we designed to collect this sample was only designed to touch the surface of the asteroid for five seconds. Five seconds after a journey that we were had been on for 17 years. Think about that for a second. So the people who are postdoctoral fellows right now working on the mission were, um, yeah, they were grade schoolers when we started. And the spacecraft was named Osiris. Um, Osiris is another Egyptian god, one that was chopped into bits and spread around Egypt. The, the, the god of agriculture brought agriculture to Egypt. And it was really coming up with the name Osiris and then the acronym, the Origins Spectral Interpretation, uh, Resource Identification, Security. We have security in there because Bennu is a potentially hazardous asteroid, one that in the future could potentially hit Earth. Regolith Explorer, so the Osiris Rex mission. So you come up with this design, you throw a few hundreds of millions of dollars at it, and you get a spacecraft. And here you can see the high gain antenna uh, on the top there. You can, I think, make out the, the sample return canister and the solar panels um, folded up in here. This is when it was built at Lockheed Martin um, near in Colorado. And uh, these are the instruments that we carried. So these are on the instrument deck. And essentially they're just variants of different wavelengths of energy. So OCAMS is a visible camera system. OLA, the laser altimeter, uses a laser to, to range fine to the surface to make a precise and accurate map of the surface. OTEST, the thermal emission spectrometer, measures the long wavelengths of energy. So it can it's really good at licking things like water um, in those long wavelengths. OVIRS is the visible infrared spectrometer. So what your eye would see out to a little bit longer than that really good for picking up silicates. And Rexis is the X-ray spectrometer. It's a student experiment, all student built at MIT. And uh, it was designed to look at X-rays um, generated by the energy of the sun and then emitted from the surface of the asteroid. But the most important instrument by far was the TAGSAM. This is a sample collection mission. First and foremost, it's to collect the sample. 
And so the instrument we designed uses pressurized gas, which flows along the annular part of this ring-like structure and fluidizes the surface. It picks up these little bits. This little mylar flap comes up and the material is deposited in a ring around the outside and the gas escapes through a vent. Here you can see a, a laboratory version of this and, and testing of this model where we did this. And we even did this in zero gravity testing. And so you know, we were pretty confident this was going to work, that we were gonna be able to use this really unique technology in order to sample the surface of an asteroid. Well, you know, nothing like a launch photo. September 8th, 2016, we went off right when we were supposed to. It was a beautiful, cloudless day in, uh, in Florida. Um, I was there for the launch and uh, it's the first time I'd ever seen a launch, a really remarkable event. Uh, the thing I remember most is colleagues told me, don't try to take pictures of it. There'll be plenty of great pictures like this one. Really just soak it in. And I remember how incredibly bright the light was, like looking at a welder's torch, you know, miles away and watching this as it, it went up and began its arcing trajectory. And ultimately we lost sight of it, knowing that after years, 15 years of planning and proposal writing and building, we actually had a spacecraft uh, leaving the planet, going to complete this amazing mission. So we got our first sample of the asteroid. Here you can see it, this little dot that moves relative to the stars. You might remember that in the, the early part, the late part of the 18th century, early part of the 19th century, when asteroids were first discovered, they were called the vermin of the sky because they tended to make streaks across photos of stellar objects. But this was our first sight. And, and then we got to within the 50 pixel image you can see in the lower right, where you can actually start to make out shapes in here. And you can see on the lower, left-hand side of that image, this thing sticking out, that's a boulder. That's a boulder that's big enough to be seen when you only have 50 pixels across the asteroid. So we finally arrived at the asteroid and uh, yeah, geez. We looked at it and we thought, there aren't any smooth spots here. There's a lot of rocks. I mean, it was really fascinating, don't get me wrong, but that's a lot of rocks. We thought, well, maybe we just have to look a little closer. There's a lot of rocks because that device we have, that tag sam, can only ingest, it can only pick up samples about two centimeters across. These rocks are tens or hundreds of meters across. Even at the finest scale, these are big rocks. Some of them are smooth. Some of them are lumpy. We started calling those cauliflower rocks. We even had some we called bacon rocks. I think we didn't have enough to eat at the time, but lots and lots and lots of rocks. But if we look long enough, eventually we found things like this. So this is a little crater um, in the southern, near the southern polar parts of the asteroid. You can see it down in the lower left-hand side. And these craters were smoother, like they had punched through that sort of rocky surface deposit and found this finer grained material underneath. The problem was they were small. So this whole field of view is about 45 meters in width. And what we thought we would land on, the, the accuracy of our landing was 50 meters. Now, those are some big rocks and you could give them names like end of mission or death rock, or as one we'll see here in a little bit, Mount Doom. You didn't want to hit one of those. And so that began a, began a very long process of looking at the asteroid and whittling this down. Now we were doing other things. Most of what I'm showing you are, are images from the OCAMs, but I wanted to give a shout out to some of the other instruments. Sometimes you use those. The, the image in the lower right is an OLA map, the laser altimeter of the shape of Bennu. And you can see this high ridge, this high standing ridge in red. The one in the upper left is a little unexpected. This is from the Rexus, from the X-ray image. The asteroid is in the lower right, that little gray spot, but that little bright spot, those are X-rays being emitted from a black hole. And so sometimes looking off the asteroid, we would see things that we didn't really expect. And so all of the instruments were really contributing to the mission. But ultimately we picked four potential landing sites. 
nightingale, kingfisher, osprey, and sandpiper. And you can see they're named for birds, informally named for birds. And this became the process of which of these four were we gonna study? So nightingale had this very large rock, rock next to it. That's the one we called Mount Doom. Kingfisher was a fairly small one. Osprey had this interesting dark spot in the middle, but another very large rock. And sandpiper was just sort of a flat, you know, nondescript area in some ways. But because we knew these were really small, we had a technological challenge in here. In the upper um, right, you can see Nightingale and the little outline there with the X on it, that's the actual size of the spacecraft. And so this began an exercise of counting every single rock that we could resolve in the imaging for this. So this is one of these in the lower left where we've counted all of these rocks. We would count the rocks, we would figure out the sizes of the rocks, and then we would try to figure out how much ingestible material there is by looking at if the material was below what we could resolve, then it might be something we could actually pick up. And just to put it in perspective, instead of a 50 meter size, we were trying to get it down to eight meters, the size of about three standard parking spaces. That had to be our landing ellipse so that we didn't hit this giant rock called Mount Doom, or we didn't wander over there into the rock field where death was certain, certain to await us. And so this was an amazing accomplishment. A shout out to my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Erica Jowan, who really worked on a lot on this sampleability, was pivotal to the decision of not just which sample site to go to, but where in that sample site to go to. And uh, the, a really amazing job by the team. Well, now that we have a site, we started doing some rehearsals. You don't just say, hey, we're gonna go there and you go there you make sure you can actually do this. And so we had what was called the checkpoint maneuver when we got to within about 50 meters of the surface and the match point maneuver, that's where we're actually matching the orbital rotation of the asteroid. And you know they look a little scary because you're kind of coming in over this giant rock, but these actually showed that we were gonna be able to fairly precisely land and sample in a specific place on the asteroid. And so now you see this video again that we've seen before. So all of that builds up to this moment, this moment of sampling. When the tag SAM comes in, it makes a conscious movement of the tag head there. It hits the surface, the gas bottle goes off, and then it just becomes a blur of material flying by. But to give you an idea of what we're looking at, the timing of all this, scientists are breaking this down into incredibly minute detail. And so this is an image of just two frames of that movie, just two. And this is the moment contact was made and the first frame. You can see at the top of the tag head, there's a little silver rim that seems to pop out at you. That's because of the rotation. But you can see the rock just at the top of the tag head seems to explode. It's very friable. It breaks apart very easily. And so whole papers, many whole papers will be written on just these two frames of imaging of what, how the asteroid was responding to the pressure of this tag head before the gas bottle was released. Well, the gas bottle released and we were able to sample and we had a complex plan in place where we were gonna spin the spacecraft and figure out how much material we had. But we ended up, it, it went differently than we thought. Instead of just touching on the surface, we went about 50 centimeters, about a half a meter down into the surface. We were in contact with the asteroid for about 5.1 seconds, but we gathered so much material that those mylar flaps, some of them were stuck open. So when we went to image the tag SAM, we realized material was coming back out. Now our success criteria was 60 grams. We needed to get 60 grams of material, okay? But if we're losing material, then we have to worry about that. So we made the decision, instead of going and doing this complex spinning maneuver and potentially losing more material, we would just go ahead and stow the tag SAM head. And so that's what we did. So this is the sample return canister. And it's amazing. Like you're actually seeing this thing being put in place, you know, far from earth, the tag SAM head. And you can even see little bits that look like they're floating up, maybe things that escaped from the surface. And then we chose to close the tag SAM, the sample return canister. And again, 
That's the last moment that we will see this tag SAM head and see the, the samples it holds until it returns to Earth. And, uh, you know, very satisfying. We did the, the experiment later of spinning the spacecraft, and we think we have about 300 grams of material, five times our minimum requirement. Now, we were able to take a, a, a tour back to the asteroid after moving far away from it. We came back because we wanted to see what was there. And this is the before and after image. So the before image with the one circle, the after image with the X in the circle. Now, if you look carefully, it may not look that different, but there's a rock that's in the circle, and then it's in the circle in the second image. First circle, second circle. That's about 12 meters apart. Doesn't look like much from this scale, but that rock is about a meter in size, weighs about one ton. A one ton rock was thrown 12 meters because of the gas from this bottle. That's the impact, the impact literally that we had on the surface of this asteroid in collecting this sample. So what happens next? Well, this is a sample return canister of the same type we're using. This is from the Stardust mission from the last decade. And this is what it'll look like the next time we see the sample return canister. When it is on the ground at the Utah Test and Training Range, we don't know if it'll spin around like this, but we will go retrieve this sample. It'll be taken to Johnson Space Center and distributed to the worldwide scientific community. Now, what we're going to do at the Smithsonian is, is we're going to study this sample. And our specialty is electron microbeam instruments. This is a scanning electron microscope in the upper uh, left. It's, it's actually a model from the manufacturer because we just bought this. Like We literally just signed the purchase order to get this brand new instrument to study these samples. And in the lower right is our only couple of year old state of the art field emission gun electron microprobe. Each of these is in the one to two million dollar range instruments. They bombard the sample with, with electrons and we can measure electrons that backscatter, we can measure x-rays, and we can learn about the composition of individual minerals at the scale of about one thousandth of a micron. So we can break that down, sub-micron size. So imagine a thousandth the width of a human hair and then break that down by, by a factor of 10. That's what we can look at. And we can learn not just the shape, we can learn not just image it, we can actually measure the chemical composition of it in here. And that's what we're gonna be doing to really study the composition of these samples and what they tell us about the origin. And as I alluded to in the introduction, the main way we're gonna do that is by Comparison with meteorites, we have about 50,000 meteorites in the Smithsonian's collection from all over the world. And they really help us ask the questions that caused us to want to go to Bennu in the first place. This is my colleague, Carrie Corrigan, uh, in the meteorite collection with a few of the drawers open. And this study that's gonna commence in September of 2023, and we have two years, really brings the mission full circle to me. This is my colleague, Carrie, again, with a our collection manager, Julie Hoskin, at the launch back in 2018. That's the back of a, of a Apollo um, vehicle at Kennedy Space Center. And so this journey that we've been on for 18 years now, we still have another uh, four. And so 22 years. So, you know, that's the better part of my entire scientific career. And in the end, Bennu is going to be by far the best studied asteroid in the solar system. Remotely, in orbital observations, and the sample that we return, we're going to know more about the asteroid Bennu likely than we know about any other asteroid in the solar system. But if we're really lucky, we're going to go back to that Christmas Eve in 1968, and we're going to be able to answer those pivotal questions about the origin of our own unique planet. And with that, I'd be delighted to take your questions, and I want to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Tim, for that presentation. I'm Ross Irwin with the Air and Space Museum, and I'd like to uh, invite all of our viewers to submit their questions in the chat. Um, here's the first one. We're used to worlds being able to shape themselves into a roughly spherical shape because they're big, and the gravity is able to round them into that shape. Why does Bennu have the shape that it does? Oh, it's a great question. So Bennu is not a solid coherent body. It's a rubble pile. 
it, it didn't form that way in the birth of the solar system. It formed from a parental asteroid that was fractured, broken apart, and parts of it reaccreted to form that shape. And so it's the natural shape that these small asteroids tend to take, these top-shaped um, asteroids, because the largest particles in there are sort of a few hundred meters in size down to, you know, dust-sized particles. And so that reaccretion and the um, rotation of those create these top shapes. So they, they look spherical, like you see on the Earth, but they're really a, a fundamentally different process, but the same sort of physics. And when you're looking at an asteroid like Bennu, that is a bunch of pieces of a larger parent body that have been broken up and then reassembled into a smaller body, you're able to sample the interior of a larger world. What did that world look like? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, that's the, really the question we want to ask. And, and the thing that's so intriguing with this is that we're seeing, um, we're seeing different lithologies, different kinds of rocks. So I mentioned those cauliflower rocks and the smooth rocks and the bacon shaped rocks. We even see what we think are pieces of, of veins of carbonate, maybe meters long and parts of a meter wide. So, you know, the best image of this is sort of a, a wet mud ball whether that was wet convecting, but imagine early in the history of the solar system, this parent asteroid accreted enough ice, that ice was then heated and melted and it started to alter everything. So we know all of the silicate minerals on, on Bennu are altered to things called phyllosilicates, water rich minerals. And so that's probably our best images. Imagine this early wet mud ball and why some parts are one way and some parts are another is really the great question we hope to answer. And you wouldn't expect that mud ball to have been wet on the surface. You know, we're not talking about rivers and lakes here. We're talking about mineralogy that is forming in the interior of it. Right. So no, that once it gets to the surface, it would be lost to the vacuum of space. So you're looking at probably water formed in the inner part of the of the asteroid where it's heated by decay of radioactive elements moving towards the surface, carrying elements with it, carrying minerals with it, then they're deposited. So much like if you think of it as um, mineral deposits on Earth. So the way they explore ores, you know, not that we have ores on Bennu, but the way they do it is they cross a boundary where that becomes unstable in the water. The same sort of thing may have happened in the early history of the solar system. It crossed a temperature boundary where that mineral precipitated out. And that's why you might have, say, a calcite vein closer to the surface rather than in the interior. You talked about the challenges of exploring uh, a small body in the solar system where the total length of time from mission planning through execution to receiving the sample at the end is a couple of decades. What are some of the challenges involved in, in doing that? Oh, well, that time scale. Oh, yeah. I mean, the biggest challenge, I mean, there are a couple of challenges, one of which is staying focused, keeping the team together. I mean, we had the, the principal investigator when we started this whole process and when OSIRIS-REx was selected for flight uh, was named Mike Drake. He was at the University of Arizona. Sadly, Mike passed away before we were even able to build the spacecraft. And so Dante Loretta, also at the University of Arizona, a colleague of mine, ended up becoming the principal investigator. But unfortunately, you see this. I mean, these are long lead missions. Typically, to get a mission selected, you have to be a senior member of the community and and that, that's one of the real challenges is some of those people move on to other things. Some of them sadly pass away. And so you have to really, I think the mission really relies on keeping the momentum going and documenting everything. The people who say built that may not be there by the time it comes back. You know, this spacecraft was built basically in 2016, 17, early 18. You know, some of those people may not be there in 2023 when we bring this sample back. And so you want to know, like, what materials did they use? What was their design? You have to document everything. You're kind of building a cathedral there. I mean, the, the people who start the mission may not be the ones who see it through. Very much so. And, and some missions last much longer than, than OSIRIS-REx has. When you're working with a, a spacecraft like this, at the time that it's operating around Bennu, it's too far away from the Earth. There's nobody sitting there with a joystick making it work. How do you plan out these maneuvers? Oh, that's a good question. So you have a set of observations you want to make. I mean, 
in, in some ways it's easy and in some ways it's more difficult I'll compare it to something else I've done, which is, you know, you know that you have to map a certain percentage of the asteroid with certain instruments. And some instruments work better when you're further away. Some instruments work better when you're up close. And so, you know, you're really trying to get coverage. You're not targeting necessarily specific areas at first. You're trying to get complete coverage. And then as you went back, so as we picked out Nightingale and Osprey and Kingfisher, then we made a series of targeted observations where we went specifically to get those and, and realized observations for one thing are not good for another. So if the sun is low in the sky, it's great for morphology. You get to see the shapes of things, the structures of things. But when the sun's high in the sky relative to the asteroid, then that's great for spectroscopy, looking at the light that bounces back and determining kinds of minerals. So you're you're always balancing these things, but it's very different from for example, the Mars rovers we heard about last month, where every day you're making a tactical decision. Do we go left? Do we go right? Do we go straight? And you sequence that. With these orbital missions, you're typically sequencing weeks in advance and then uploading those sequences and then the mission carries those out, the spacecraft carries those out. So you know, what they call running a spacecraft is really writing a big computer program. Mm -hmm. Bennett was discovered in 1999 and, and it was imaged using radar. What are we able to tell about an asteroid from radar here on the Earth? Because most of the asteroids that might pass close by, we're not gonna be able to visit up close. That's right. So radar, um, I'll tell you about another mission. Radar has been pivotal. The Arecibo, a great loss to the community. The Arecibo is, is no longer functional. Um, but you can learn the shape of the asteroid, which is really important. If you're going to plan an orbital mission, imagine, you know, it, or, uh, Bennu is fairly, um, you know, top shaped, fairly spherical. You can imagine orbiting that Itakawa was like orbiting a potato, you know, do you go around the short part of the potato? If you want to go around the long part of the potato, then the asteroid is coming really close to you and far away. I mean, it's a real challenge. So, so knowing those shapes is really important if you're going to plan a mission. But it also can tell you about the nature of the surface. So the Psyche mission that, I, that was mentioned that I'm working on, the radar um, work showed us that that's probably a metal rich surface. That's what really drove us to want to go to Psyche. And so these radar properties are, are just another thing in our toolkit to learn in a way that we can't learn just from reflected light. If you had someone visit an asteroid like Bennu, what would be some of the challenges involved with putting a person down on the ground and having them be able to collect samples? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, let's put it this way. Bennu is 500 meters across, right? Let's take an asteroid that's 60 times longer, Eros, 33 kilometers in length. If you were a golfer, you like to golf, you're on Eros and you hit the ball, it's simply not coming back, okay? And uh, if you stood on the end of the asteroid and you were say a decent long jumper and you jumped, you wouldn't come back to the asteroid. So these have almost no gravity, they have, you know, a 10,000th, a 100,000th the gravity of Earth. And so that's why we had to design this instrument. People think, well, you just land on the asteroid and you pick up a sample. You can't actually do it. I mean, we see rocks coming off of, of Bennu. It's an active asteroid. And we didn't talk about this, but we've seen pieces flying off, rocks that are thrown off the asteroid, that some actually orbit the asteroid and come back. The energy it takes to throw those off is about the same amount of energy that it takes for you to break a saltine cracker. And so you don't land on them, you don't walk on them, you don't dock on them, you literally touch them. That's why we designed the tag SAM as a touch. We're kissing the asteroid, getting the sample, five seconds, that's what we had to do. And how did that tap? reshape the surface. I mean, you, you, you talked about a little pit was formed, you talked about some rocks moving, but what sort of impact did you make on that surface? I mean, if you had well, to compare it to um, punching a pillow or something, I mean, you know, how much energy did you put into that? Oh, um, if any of you ride bikes, it's about the same amount of, you know, 
the, the canisters themselves aren't that different from the bikes, that, the little canisters that you use as an emergency to blow up a bike tire if you get a, a flat out on the road, you know, little canister about, oh, you know, that big. Um, but it formed a hole that we think is about eight meters across. It's about 50, um, 50 centimeters deep, something like that. Um, we actually were below the level of the surface for something like 16 seconds, uh, originally moving forward. So even as we touched the asteroid, we were still moving at four centimeters per second. It didn't stop us. In fact, it never compressed that, that tag SAM arm had a spring in it. We never compressed that tag SAM arm. So it moved down and then it backed its way once the thrusters threw. And we were below that surface for about 16 seconds. Um, in terms of energy, I can tell you when we did these things on Earth, you know, you saw the example there. That was the same system, the same amount of gas, and they made basically a little ripple. But on these asteroids, they make massive changes to the asteroid. Another one of the questions focuses on the sample that you're going to be bringing back to the Earth. The sample is going to be uh, brought down in a vehicle that can re-enter the atmosphere, land off of a parachute. How is it going to be recovered and how are you going to prevent contamination of that sample? Oh, great question. So it's going to come to the Utah Test and Training Range and they set up a field um, curation facility basically there. So they'll collect the sample return canister um, that came down by parachute. They'll take it to there and they never are going to open it outside of a controlled environment. So the only things that are going to come into contact with the sample, there's a very short list of materials, dry nitrogen, um, completely dry nitrogen, stainless steel, and Teflon are the only materials. These are the same materials that have come into contact with the lunar rocks for more than 50 years. And, and uh, you know, they will do that initially. So they'll open the sample return capsule. And inside that is the canister that has the sample. Um, that's what they will take then to Johnson Space Center. And only after putting it inside there, will they open the, the TAG-SAM itself, um, the TAG-SAM head? And so that is really the trick. I mean, you know, we love meteorites. I work on meteorites. But as soon as they fall to Earth, they're just in this life-rich environment, this water-rich environment. That's what we want to prevent. That's why this sample is so special, because we'll be able to look at those organics and look at that water without any contamination from Earth. We can control that through this process. You've seen a lot of meteorites and you have a vast collection of meteorites at the Natural History Museum. Do you expect to be able to look at these samples that you pick up from Bennu and say, hey, I've seen this before and be able to pull one off the shelf? Ah, oh, good question. Um, you know, we do have a lot of meteorites. I, I've spent more than 20 years classifying Antarctic meteorites. I've probably classified 10,000 different meteorites. I certainly hope not. I mean, I certainly hope that what we see is something different. And, and I think as we get deeper into the sample, I think at first you're going to look at it and go, oh, it looks a lot like that. But as we dig a little deeper, I think we're going to see some things that are different. And we're probably going to see something that's really rare. We have very few examples on Earth of, say, anything that looks like these bright, potentially carbonate materials, these layered rocks. We have very few like that. I think the cauliflower rocks that I showed you, those lumpy ones, that's probably the one we're most likely to have something like that on Earth, but probably not exactly like that. And I think this is going to be a the, we have two years to do the analysis. A lot of it's going to be digging through the collection and saying, okay, you know, let's go to the weird ones and see which one's exactly alike, or is there one exactly alike? We're going to learn a lot from these samples from the meteorite collection. But the samples are going to ask a lot of questions that we're then going to go back and spend the next decades re-looking at the collection in light of these samples. A lot of the questions tonight have focused on the chances of an asteroid like Bennu hitting the Earth. In your view, how many, what percentage of the asteroids that have a good chance, you know, something greater than zero, of hitting the Earth over the next few hundred years have we found so far? And how many do you think are still out there? Oh, really good question. Um, you know, how many we found, you know, you get down to the size. I mean, it's it's a size scalar, right? And so things that are sort of half a kilometer in size, like Bennu, we're probably approaching finding most of those. As you get down to smaller and smaller sizes, if you want to get down to 100 meters, and if you get down to something like five meters, 
Um, there are probably still a lot of those out there. But I think it's really important to realize that when you worry about something like that, you know, we're learning a lot from Bennu about the structure of these asteroids, these rubble piles, because more than what it's made of, it's how it's put together is going to determine how it behaves. The other part is you have to realize that these predictions we have that something could hit the Earth are very uncertain because asteroids don't move necessarily at this size range at what we call Newtonian orbits. They don't follow the same orbit every time. They're actually influenced by the sun in something called a Yarkovsky or Yorp effect, where they absorb the sun on one side and radiate heat on the other. That can actually change the orbit. That's something we're trying to measure with the data from the spacecraft of how much the orbit changes, because that's the greatest uncertainty of whether something might hit the Earth in the future. And realize that all of this information we learn can go into helping us mitigate something like that. Because it's not so much that we're going to blow one up if it's coming to Earth. We want to discover them early and move them out of the way. And you only have to nudge them a tiny bit so they don't intersect the orbit of the Earth. When you look at an, an, an asteroid like Bennu, it has some very small chance of striking the Earth but it, it seems to be more likely to hit the sun if you project that orbit out long enough. It could hit Venus. It could be thrown out of the solar system by Jupiter. Yeah, we, well, that's what, go ahead. We don't have necessarily a clear idea what's gonna to happen to them. No, and most of these, new, we know that near Earth asteroids like Bennu are not stable in the long term. Most of them are either gonna fall into the sun or be ejected from the uh, solar system, more likely fall into the sun. And so, you know, the sun is a huge target, gravitational well. And so the overwhelming number of these over the history of the solar system, remember a near earth asteroid may only be in that orbit for tens of millions of years. The earth is, the solar system is four and a half billion years old. So generation after generation after generation of these things have come into the inner solar system and the vast majority end up in the sun. Could you describe just for a few minutes the path that you took to get from childhood where you might have been interested in the solar system to where you are now so that other people oh. might be able to follow that same path? Oh, sure. Um, so I was a child of the space age. I was born in 1964. So, you know, really came up during Apollo and, and was very enthusiastic about space. At one point, I wanted to be an astronomer and then I took physics and decided I didn't like physics. But I took a geology course and I, I thought to myself, hmm, that's interesting. You know, we must have rocks from outer space. I know we have moon rocks. Someone must study them. Why not me? And so I went to a school, Eastern Illinois University, which is better known for football players and football coaches than it is for planetary scientists. But uh, I got a geology degree hoping to become a planetary scientist. No one there was a planetary scientist. No one there knew any planetary scientist. So I did what you did in the day. I went down to the library and I started pulling catalogs for graduate programs and I applied to some of them. And lo and behold, I got one into one of them, got a master's at the University of New Mexico. My advisors all shipped off to the University of Hawaii. So I went with them, seemed like a good thing to do, go spend four years in Honolulu. After that, I went to Johnson Space Center and uh, in the greatest luck, and I think you know, in any career, you get maybe two lucky breaks and it's whether you can take advantage of those or not. Um, the curator of meteorites at the Smithsonian retired and I applied for and got the job and I've been here, it'll be 25 years this year. And so, you know, I think when people tell you that, oh, well, you know, there's a long shot, you'll ever get that job. Yeah, but it's a shot worth taking. And as I tell everyone, if all you do, if all I'd ever done was spend my seven years getting my degrees and I had gotten to do planetary science that whole time and then I'd gone off and done something completely different. I would have lived the dream for seven years. How many people get to say that? Um, you know, so. Having been involved in this mission, when you first saw Bennu up close, what was your biggest surprise? Rocks, <laughs> lots and lots and lots of rocks. I mean, I would have, I would have bet a hundred bucks. I would have bet a thousand dollars that there was gonna be a fine grained area. I mean, I thought for sure, we're just gonna come up to this asteroid. There's gonna be a fine grained area. We had this complex process for how we were gonna decide the landing site. But as soon as we got there, we we're gonna be like there. And then we we're gonna do all this work and the answer was gonna be there. And the answer wasn't there. I mean, that was the most remarkable thing. And I think 
The downside is it made the whole process a lot more difficult, a lot more time consuming, a lot more energy, a lot more money. The upside is it forced us to really, really look at this asteroid in a way that I don't think we might have had we gotten the easy answer. I mean, we really poured over these images. We looked at every single rock. I mean, counting rocks down to 10 centimeters in size, which we could do with the images. I mean, we really know this asteroid as, about, as well as any asteroid can be known. We go through very much the same kind of very fussy landing site selection process for Mars rovers, as you know, where you're trying to land on another planet, but is the landing site safe? You, you have to be able to, to get there and just study the heck out of the place before you'll yeah. be able to. Before you'll be well, able you have to. the disadvantage of wind, which uh, at least we don't have on Bennu. You know, it's kind of like, why did the restaurant on Bennu go out of business? No atmosphere. Mm. So <laughs> there, there you go. These samples that you bring back, they are meteorites. I mean, they're going to be very much like the, the meteorites that, that have fallen through the atmosphere and landed on the ground. You, you wouldn't still call it a meteorite though. No, meteorites by definition are things that survive passage through the atmosphere. But really, you know, it's kind of semantics. It's whether it's a meteorite, whether it's a sample, you know, they're samples of asteroids and that's the important part. I think we tend to get caught up in classification and nomenclature and all these sorts of things. But, you know, we learn, take the example, you know, we had, in many ways, it's the exact opposite. Think of it this way. We had samples from the moon long before we got meteorites from the moon. It was because we had samples from the moon that we recognized meteorites from the moon. Here we're doing it the exact opposite way. We have many, many samples from these primitive carbonaceous asteroids, but we haven't really gotten the samples from the asteroids. So we don't know if we have the full set. We don't know if we have the full diversity. We don't have the context for all of these. And so in many ways, these sample return missions are a new style of planetary science for us. But if you keep in mind that you're studying the same stuff, yeah, there's some differences, fusion crust, contamination. But if you keep in mind you're studying the same stuff, then really you have this whole set because if all you had were the sample, if all you had was this little bit from Bennu, you probably wouldn't understand what you were looking at. It's because we've had this rich history of meteorites to ask these questions that we can hopefully answer some of them with Bennu and ask a new set of questions. And that, that's the fun. We're planning to leave Bennu next month and there's going to be a flyby done on the way out. Having spent this much time getting ready to go there and this much time studying the place, have you learned everything that you've wanted to know about it? Are you ready to go? Are you looking forward to studying the samples more than answering new questions that you might have been able to answer if you'd stayed longer? Well, that's sort of like, you know, do you have any regrets? I think the only regret that, that I have is um, the Rexus instrument, unfortunately, didn't really work for us on the surface of the asteroid because the sun was in a very quiet phase. It wasn't generating enough solar energy to actually produce x-rays. And so it would have been great to see that instrument work and to see it map the surface of the asteroid. But that's a solar cycle. We would have to stay another seven years to get it to work. So I don't think it's worth it. I just as soon get the samples back on Earth. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you very much, Tim, for sharing your incredible experience with this mission and your great depth of expertise on, on this subject. Um, it's just really been a, a wonderful story that you've been able to share with all of our viewers. Um, I want to extend a big thank you again to our sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance for making this lecture series possible. Uh, please join us for the next Exploring Space lecture, which will take place on May 26th, is entitled Dragonfly, in situ exploration of Titan, Saturn's moon Titan in organic ocean world. Our June lecture covers a rediscovery of the planet Venus as a different world than the one that we might have known just a short time ago. Please sign up for reminders on our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thanks again to all of you and have a good night.